Hello, everybody. Um, this is a makeup lecture uh, in uh, Ordinary Differential Equation course. And uh, we'll talk about uh, some special types of, of nonlinear systems um, where the methods of Lyapunov and um, uh, the, the techniques we've talked about so far are uh, quite relevant. And um, again, these are special types of systems. We're going to start talking by, uh, about gradient systems. And then uh, we'll also mention um, a class of Hamiltonian systems. OK, so let's get started. Um, so I will uh, first introduce the uh, uh, class of gradient systems. And that can be done in. Um, not just in two dimensions, but in any any number of dimensions. So let's assume that we have um, in n dimensions uh, consider a uh, function v, <clears throat> and for simplicity, let's let's assume it's defined everywhere um, in R n, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, and we're going to assume that this is differentiable. Um, well, what, what does that mean? That basically says you can take, um, you can uh, make a linear linearization of v around every point, and uh, um, you know we also consider that it's um, even more than that. Uh, that the uh, gradient. So let's let's introduce the gradient. of v is actually defined as grad v is going to be a vector uh, of the partial derivatives. So let's just um, introduce that. So it's going to be partial of v with respect to x1 and so forth, partial of v with respect to xn. Okay, So this is going to be a um, <coughs> well-defined vector, and we're also going to assume that this is a continuous, continuously differentiable um, in terms of the of the variables. Okay, so in the end, we're going to assume that our original function has enough smoothness, so it can be differentiated at least twice. Okay, so um, what we're going to um, introduce is a uh, dynamical system. So uh, consider the nonlinear system uh, given by the following expression. So we're going to take x prime equals. minus the grad of v of x, or v at x. Okay. So let's first try to understand this a little bit better. Um, so <clears throat> as usual, a nonlinear system is actually defining a um, direction field. So the right-hand side of this nonlinear system is, is describing the direction field. If of a um, at each point in in R n, and uh, then the solutions of this nonlinear systems would be basically curves that fit that uh, direction field, or well, the tra trajectories are such that uh, they fit this direction field. So this is going to be uh, what we call um, a gradient system. Or, or its um, so let's say a definition. A gradient system x prime equals. I'm sorry. Let's start again. So 
um, we're gonna we're gonna say that a um, nonlinear system x prime equals f of x is a gradient system if there exists v a function from r into r such that f is, can be written as the a gradient or the negative gradient we're going to talk about grad, uh, the uh, sign in a second gradient of a f scalar function okay sometimes v is called the potential um, of this of this function f so in any case one of the questions is how do we recognize a uh, system as being a gradient system and of course um, also if we know uh, that a system is a gradient system then what properties uh, does the system have and, and so forth okay. so I think the easiest is to actually start with the second question that is um, if I have if I know I have a gradient system what are the properties okay so let's start by um, the first important property a property of a gradient system which is the following basically uh, says that uh, the function V is a Lyapunov function for the system x prime equals minus grad v of x and if you recall what does it mean to have a Lyapunov function for a system Well, the key property of a Lyapunov function for a system is that it is decreasing or not increasing on along the trajectories of the system. Okay, so let's see why that's the case. <clears throat> so here's a proof of that of this statement. Um, so imagine you have a solution of this uh, system with some initial condition. The initial condition will play no uh, important role here. But let's assume I have a solution. So let's assume x of t is a solution of this system. And naturally, we're interested in this um, function or mapping which takes t into the value of, a, of v at x of t. Okay, so that's that's the function that we'd like to show that is it actually is non-increasing. So need to show that the derivative um, is less than or equal than zero. Okay. So, if you remember, we actually talked a little bit about derivative of a function along a solution, along a curve, 
in the phase space. And if you remember, we talked about, um, also you've talked in, in Calculus 3 about uh, the directional derivative. So the by the chain rule, we can actually write the derivative of V along A solution as being, let's say, it's going to be the derivative of V with respect to each uh, variable. So that's going to be partial of V with respect to X1 right, um, times x1 prime. Let's do it like this. So I'm going to assume x is x1 xn plus partial of v with respect to x2 times x2 prime plus partial of v with respect to xn xn prime. Okay, and there is uh, always a better way of writing this if we, in terms of um, we're using the gradient, so it's going to be the gradient of V, right? Where is the gradient of V going to be computed? Well, it's going to be computed at X of T, so let's just suppress that, dotted with X prime, okay? So X prime is, has components X1 prime, X2 prime, Xn prime. Okay, but what is what is the grad, what is the x prime? Well, if it's a solution of the system, then it has to be minus grad of v, right? At x of t. So maybe it is better to emphasize this is at t, and this is the grad, so let me do that like this. It's going to be the grad of v at x of t, dotted with minus, gra uh, excuse me, dotted with x prime. So this is grad of uh, v at x of t dotted with minus the same thing, grad of v at x of t. Okay, because that's, that's what x prime is. So you see it's, you get basically that um, it's a vector dotted dot product with uh, itself with a minus in front. So it's minus and a vector dot product with itself is the same as the length square of the vector. So it's minus grad of v of x of t squared and obviously this is non-positive. So it's less than or equal than zero. It could be zero if We'll talk about this in a second. If the, gradient, if the gradient of V happens to be zero at some uh, value of X of T, okay? But obviously it's, it's not increasing, so that shows that V is, is non-increasing along solution trajectories. Okay. Now this really is, uh, according to our definition, is qualifies V uh, as a uh, Lyapunov function. Now notice that in the previous definition, in the, in the Lyapunov stability for equilibria that we talked earlier, we also were requiring that V has to be, has to have a minimum at, at a equilibrium, equilibrium point. Okay. So, if in addition we have that property, if we have, uh, we'll see what kind of equilibrium points correspond to V in, um, for gradient systems. But if we have that property, then we actually infer, we can infer uh, things like stability of the equilibrium and um, even more asymptotic stability for equilibrium of gradient systems. So let's see how that, how that goes. Okay, so let's uh, saying 
what is an equilibrium for an equilibrium for a, a gradient system? Well, obviously it has to be is a point or you know a state x star such that minus the gradient or just the gradient of v at x star is zero. Okay. Now, if you remember from multivariable calculus, this really means that x star is a critical point for. Um, for v. Okay. And it means that it has all partial derivatives at x star vanish. Okay. So far so good? So literally what we're, we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at equilibrium points uh, which correspond to the critical points of our uh, function v. Hmm? So let's see an example. Let's say v, well in R2, so it's probably easiest to visualize. In R2, let's take v of x. We're going to switch to x and y rather than x1, x2. Uh, let's take x squared times x minus 1 squared plus y squared. Okay, so that's that's a function of two variables. Um, it has some nice property, but properties, but uh, for now it just is important that we can differentiate this at least twice and we still end up with something continuous. So what is the gradient system corresponding to this function? Well, it's simply going to be x prime equals minus gradient of v, where x is, a capital X is x, y. Okay, so uh, we just compute what's partial of u with respect to x and what's partial of u with respect to y. Well, um, we can do that fairly easy. So it's 2x, x minus 1 squared, right, plus x squared times 2x minus 1. So I get 2x, x minus 1, and then 2x minus 1. Okay? What's partial of u with respect to y? Simply 2y. So, what's the system? Well, x prime has to be minus partial of u with respect to x, and y prime equals minus partial of u with respect to y. Okay, and again, we'll talk about this minus sign in a second. Um, so this is minus 2x, x minus 1, 2x minus 1, and minus 2y. Okay? So this system, as you see, it's, it's nonlinear, at least in the x variable, of course. Uh, it's also decoupled, so that's, you know, you could say it's a little bit easier, but uh, uh, let's, let's, let's draw the direction field here. Uh, excuse me, let's draw the um, face portrait. So we're going to use p-plane again. This is going to be minus 2 times x times x minus 1 times 2 times x minus 1. And y prime is negative 2 times y. Okay, and um, the bounds are not so important, so let's see. Um, minus 3 to 3. We'll see if we need to adjust that. Okay, so that's the direction field. So let's plot a few solutions. In fact, before I do that, let's let's just plot the um, 
and it, let's erase everything and let's just plot the level curves of this function v so that's function v was x squared times x minus 1 squared plus y squared and let's see do we let p plane decide well let's see what happens okay so it looks like it has gotten these values um, but that's not really good enough so let's instead of let's kind of control this so let's put um, the level sets starting with one two three four let's see that okay so we just added a few more um, maybe I should add point one point five Okay, so now you kind of start seeing this um, level curve. So basically it says that the function takes constant value along these curves. And you can see also the equilibrium, that, that is the critical points. How do we find the critical points of a function of two variables? Hmm? Well, we just simply have to take the um, so the gradient equal to zero. So it's it's very standard to uh, since we have already rolled the system, just to put the right hand side is equal to zero here. And obviously, this is corresponds to equilibrium of the dynamical system. So you can see there is an equilibrium when x is zero. There's an equilibrium when x is one. And there's an equilibrium when x is one half, and of course y has to be zero at all times. So we have three equilibria, right? So let's see. The third one should be the one in the middle here. Okay. Okay. So since this is probably too small, uh, let's just change the window size just negative one to two for x. and say negative 2 to 2 for y okay so now it's more clear how and the level sets let's introduce one more so it's 0 0.05 okay so now you actually see this um, the level sets become two distinct curves uh, so well anyhow so you can kind of imagine the um, if v would would correspond to an elevation, then you would see basically that you have two lows, right? And those are the zero values, and then you have a saddle point in between. So that's this would be a saddle point. Uh, you can compute the value and to see that it's actually above zero. Okay, so. Um, let's now plot a few solutions. So remember what we said is V acts as a Lyapunov function, that is the solution will actually decrease along this, um, well the value of the function is going to decrease along solutions. So let's just take one uh, such function and you can see, what do you see? You actually see that it, according to this direction field, it actually goes towards that equilibrium as t goes to infinity, and of course, as t goes to negative infinity, it would actually go away from the origin, from the from that equilibrium. Okay, so uh, here's where the negative sign in front of the gradient is important because what if you were to change the negative sign into a positive sign? Well, you see, all of this direction field, the direction field will change its direction completely, right? Opposite direction. So you would actually go to negative infinity towards an equilibrium and to positive infinity away from the equilibrium, as well as v would increase along solutions instead of decrease along solutions. So anyway, that's sort of just a um, convention. I mean, it's just a standard way of writing a gradient system. So um, notice that there is actually something even more interesting that's happening. Well. Not only that, 
um, all these solutions are actually approaching some equilibrium and none is approaching a settle. Well, I should take it back. You have something that approaches a settle if you start right on the vertical axis here, but anyway, that's uh, just for this particular system. Um, but you also have another situation, another um, nice property. If you see, and it may not be very clear on this graph because it's not, it's the scale along the x-axis and the y-axis are not quite exactly the same, but um, if you were to kind of make it exactly the same, so make this a square, then you would actually see that um, the trajectories actually intersect the level curves of the function v at a 90 degree angle. Yep. And again, I'm not saying anything uh, new here since in calculus 3 you learn that the gradient of a function, the vector which represents the gradient of a function at a point is, is always orthogonal to the level curve corresponding to that point. Okay. So notice that here you have um, at every, every time, well, at every point if you draw the solution of the system and if you draw the level curve corresponding to that point for the function v there, there is a 90 degree uh, angle between those two curves. Okay? And obviously, what does it mean? So let's let's make that formal. Uh, well, let's say equilibrium is when partial of v and partial of v with respect to x and partial of v with respect to y are both zero. So this is when x is zero and y is zero, or x is one, y is zero, or x is a half and y is zero. Okay. Now V is decreasing along solutions. Um, because, right? Because the uh, derivative with respect to T of V along a solution X of T is minus the length of the gradient squared and this is actually is strictly less than zero so V is decreasing along solutions um, that are not uh, constant or steady state or equilibrium. Okay. So two things here so one is that if, so that's the Lyapunov function, okay, and you can see that there's also something about asymptotic stability, so that's the strict Lyapunov function because you have strict inequality. The other thing is, is what I said earlier, is that uh, solutions x of t, well, solution curves, or trajectories are uh, perpendicular to uh, the level curves of V. Okay. So how do we how do we kind of see this? So let's let's just a uh, picture actually says everything here. Let's assume that we have Um, well, I should also say non-constant solution curves are perpendicular to the level curves uh, of V. So let's assume I have a solution that goes through this point, okay, and that's um, level curve. So this is, well, let's say this is x naught and this is the level curve so it's V inverse remember we use this notation V inverse of um, 
the value of v at x naught. Okay? So that would be, I don't know, some constant c. And let's assume that uh, x naught is not an equilibrium. Okay? That basically means that gradient of v at x naught is not zero as a vector, so uh, we also call this x naught to be a regular point for um, for the system. Then, let's take the solution that goes through this. Well, the solution will actually be, let's use a different color, it will actually be obeying the direction at this point, in the direction field, right? So the, if this is x0, uh, then there's going to be a vec, there's going to be a vector grad v at x naught and I'm going to put a minus so that the gradient is actually opposite direction okay. and why is this vector going to be perpendicular to the level curve? Well, What does it mean to be a level curve? The perpendicular to the level curve well what it says it there exists a curve gamma of t uh, in this level curve so there's a basically there's a parameterization of this uh, of this level curve in 2D and in higher dimensions it just means that there is a curve um, whose such that the derivative of this curve, of, of this parameterization, so d by dt at time zero is tangent to the level curve. I should I should call this parameterization. Okay, so all we're doing is we're we're just um, giving a parameterization to this level curve, and this way we're getting a vector, and the question is that we we want to uh, ask is. What's the angle between those two vectors? Well, to show that they're perpendicular, it's enough to take the dot product, right? So we can actually do that, show that that dot product is 0 the following way. So we know that v of gamma of t is 0 is constant, excuse me. This basically says derivative with respect to t of v of gamma of t is 0. And again, using the same kind of uh, directional derivative, um, this basically says that the gradient of v at, well, we're going to say at time equals 0. So gradient of v at x0 dotted with gamma prime of t at time equals 0 is 0. But what is the gamma prime? Well, that's exactly... that tangent vector. Okay, so this is tangent uh, vector to the level curve. And what we just shown is that the gradient is indeed perpendicular. So the solution curves, the uh, um, value of V along solution curves not only decreases, if you're not at a if you're not at, if you're at a regular point, so if, if you're not at an equilibrium already, then the solutions 
the values of the solution, uh, the values of V along solutions are decreasing, and actually they're decreasing at their fastest possible uh, rate. So that's also given by um, that result saying that the gradient direction is the uh, direction of steepest ascent and the minus gradient is the direction of steepest descent. Okay, so, so moreover uh, minus grad V at X naught is the direction of steepest descent That is, V along that direction uh, decreases at the fastest possible rate among all other directions. Okay? So, um, so anyway, we've kind of, ex we've kind of uh, explained why this solution is actually uh, um, intersect or, or form uh, an orthogonal set of uh, curves uh, with respect to the um, level curves of the function V. Um, we haven't really said why um, the solutions necessarily go to an equilibrium point, but of course that depends on how many equilibrium points the V has, uh, the function V has. And um, probably best is Um, maybe to uh, summarize this and then go to that proof. So let's let's summarize the properties. So the properties of the gradient system of a gradient system. So what we've talked about so far is. Um, is if um, C is a regular value for the function V, meaning that um, the level curve or level set if it's higher dimension, uh, the inverse of C has no equilibrium points. Then the direction field is perpendicular to the level set. Okay, so all all the solutions intersect at 90 degrees that direct, that that, that uh, level curves, level curve. Um, the critical points of V are uh, same as equilibrium points. Of um, of the system. And finally, if a critical point of V is uh, isolated minimum, then this point is an asymptotically stable equilibrium. So this uh, we've we've shown actually the part A and part B. Why is part C true? Well, again, if I have a critical point, it's a minimum point, so local minimum, right? I mean, the function could actually be I don't know having more multiple minimum points, but if I have a minimum point here, so I'm just plotting sort of a a graph of a, of, a, of a function like this, then this point 
even though it's not actually the value of the v at this point doesn't have to be zero, right? But it's just that it's a minimum among its neighboring points. Right? And also we require this to be isolated. So there is a neighborhood of this point where there is no other uh, critical points. Okay? If that's the case, then what do we have? We basically have that v is a strictly up on our function. So the derivative along solutions is strictly less than zero, meaning that I have that Lyapunov stability theorem saying that the solution is, I mean, the equilibrium is asymptotically stable. Okay. With some basin of attraction, of course, um, which may not be the whole thing since there might be another uh, equilibrium point that is also asymptotically stable some in some other location. Okay. But basically it's saying you know, not only that solutions are approaching, um, well, is that solutions are start near the um, equilibrium, but it also approaches some sort of a, you know, in a um, um, straightforward fashion. So there's no, there's going to be no. Uh, spiraling in, for instance. Okay, so let's um, see the two more things that I mentioned, but we didn't actually prove. So there's one thing saying the following. Well, so this one is probably the same, but. Okay, so all right. So the first, the first thing to notice is that at a um, equilibrium point um, x star, the linearized, the linearization. The linearization um, has the form. Well, let's see. So I have uh, dx one dt is minus partial of v with respect to x one. dx two dt minus partial f2, right, this is the original system. So how do we linearize? We simply take this, this would be f1, this would be f2, this would be fn, right? How do we linearize the system? So I guess um, this is not the linearization. This is the full system. Um, we linearize the original gradient system. And get. Well, I'm not going to write it as a system, but I'm just going to write dxi over dt is. So it's going to be the partials, right? Remember how, how we take We take the partials of f1 with respect to x1 through xn. We put them in a row. Um, so if you look at it carefully enough, you will see that this is actually um, is going to be a matrix A times X, where A is minus second partial of V with respect to X, I, X, J. So I and J from 1 to N. So this is a square matrix. But what's more important is actually a symmetric. Since mixed partial derivatives of a function that's smooth enough uh, are the same whether we take partial with respect to xi and then xj or xj and then xi. Okay. 
Okay. So the eigenvalues of A are have a very special property. The share, I mean, all the symmetric matrices with real coefficients uh, share this property. The eigenvalues of the matrix of a symmetric matrix are real. Okay, so being real, what it means is basically that there are no complex, there's no imaginary parts of those eigenvalues, so that basically says no spiral, spiraling in or out of the equilibrium. Okay? So in other words, you cannot have a gradient system for which you have an equilibrium here and you have a solution doing this thing. Okay? So this cannot happen. For gradient systems. Okay, even if it's asymptotically stable, the only way you can actually approach is through some some sort of you know direct uh, well to be asymptotically stable both eigenvalues of the linearization should be negative, in which case you're actually going like this. And uh, that indeed is consistent with that uh, property that you know the solutions really have to be orthogonal to or perpendicular to the level curves and the level curves near local minimum are sort of closed curves okay okay so that's one thing and the other thing is the other uh, fact that Uh, I mentioned, but now let's see why is the case. Um, the property that um, if x of t is the solution of the gradient system, then um, The omega limit set of x of t is a is an equilibrium, and um, same for alpha limit set. This would be the limit as t goes to negative infinity. Okay. So what is the omega limit set again? Is basically the set of points. That are visited, you know, infinite, uh, arbitrarily closed by solutions, by the solution x of t. Okay, and what this is saying is that, you know, a solution of a gradient system never kind of wanders, uh, let's say, um, you know, indefinitely in the space. Um, But if it if it if it goes towards a point, that point is an equilibrium. So um, should be a little bit more careful here and say that um, the omega limit set of uh, of x of t, if it exists, okay, because it might not exist. The the solution might go to infinity in the plane or in the space. Okay. So let's prove this. So. So let's Z be a omega limit point. Of a solution X of T. Okay. Then what do we have? Well, we basically have a solution going towards Z 
on which v is actually uh, non non increasing, actually decreasing, right? But on the other hand, it if we are to say that uh, the solution starting at z were to be non-constant, so if, if we were assume to that, that z is not an equilibrium, so if z were not an equilibrium, uh, then uh, we can actually obtain a contradiction uh, the same way as in the um, uh, LaSalle invariance principle which basically said uh, that if you don't have an equilibrium, then this this solution, the Lyapunov function, along that solution, starting at z, is going to strictly decrease. Right at the same time, z being a, a omega limit set, there are infinitely uh, there there are points approaching that uh, z, so there are points on the solution x of t n. Right, so just to remind you, x of t n goes to z, right? Um, and then you can take v along x of tn plus s. So with a small positive s, this approaches um, v of, you know, the solution starting at z with value s which is strictly less than V of Z, okay? But this contradicts the fact that well, V of X of Tn does approach V of Z, okay? And then on a different sequence, V of X of Tn plus S goes to something that's strictly less than V of Z. So that's a contradiction, right? Okay, so basically that means that um, Z, well, that basically means that solutions through Z solutions through Z um, is such that that V of phi S of Z is um, constant in S. So basically it means that the derivative even when S is zero is zero, meaning that the gradient of V at Z is zero. Right? So that basically says that C is an equilibrium. Okay. All right. So that's um, that's this, and of course, the similar proof is for um, alpha limit set. Um, So, all right. So finally, before we start talking about Hamiltonian systems, let me ask, let me uh, address this question of when do we, um, how do we recognize a system being a gradient system? So how to recognize when, when a system is gradient system? Well, so just to give you a concrete example is let's assume that um, I have the following. So I have x 
prime equals equals um, y squared plus 2xy and y prime equals x squared plus 2xy okay, so that's that's a nonlinear system and the question is can we write it in a um, in a, in a uh, gradient form so the question is can we find a function whose gradient is this actually opposite this right so minus that So, question is, is there a v such that, you know, minus gradient, minus the uh, partial of v with respect to x is y squared plus 2xy, and with respect to y is x squared plus 2xy. Okay. Well, so that's something you may have seen actually uh, in some calculus course where you're asking, you know, is it possible to find such a v? Well, the first test you, you, can, uh, you can apply to get the answer yes or no is um, if, there, if there were such a function, then the mixed partial derivatives, the second partial derivatives, would have to be the same, right? Well, in this case, if that's uh, what it is, let's call this uh, f and this g, right, so that would be the right hand side of the system, then this corresponds to what? What's well, partial with respect to x of g, it has to equal the partial of f with respect to y. Okay, so does it happen in this case? In our example, partial of f with respect to y is, what is it, 2y plus 2x, and partial of g with respect to x is 2x plus 2y. So indeed they match. And that in itself is not actually a um, guarantee that there is such a function v. There is one additional ingredient. And that additional ingredient is that V is defined so in addition, V is defined on the entire R2, so and the partial of I'm sorry, not V, but uh, F and G, and the partial of G with respect to X partial of f with respect to y, that actually is enough to um, to imply that there is v with um, you know partial of v with respect to x equals f partial of v with respect to y is g and you know maybe I should put stay with that convention that uh, I mean, we're looking for v for which the right hand side is minus the gradient so I need the minus f minus g okay so so this test is uh, you know sufficient in the case when the the functions are defined on either the entire plane or uh, what's called simply connected regions Okay. Now, how would we f actually find such a v if we had to? Well, it's as simple as once we, we verify that such a v exists, it's simply as taking the in integrating with respect to x the first one, and then the second one with respect to y. Right. So, how do we do that? Let's see. So, in this example, and then probably you remember. Um, so partial of v with respect to x is minus f, which means v of x and y is minus the integral of f of x and y with respect to 
x, right? So in our case is minus integral of y squared plus 2xy with respect to x. So it's minus xy squared plus x squared y. Okay? Plus some constant that may depend on y, right? Because we integrate with respect to x. Right? And then you go and say, well, I want partial of v with respect to y to be minus g, so all I have to do is differentiate this, so it's c prime of y plus minus um, x two x y plus x squared it has to equal g or minus g minus what was g is x squared plus two x y. So in this case, these two cancel. C prime of y is zero, so c y is just a constant. So here we get v of x and y is minus x y squared plus x squared y plus a constant c, but um, when we take the gradient, that constant disappears, so the, this is just a fine function whose gradient gives you those right-hand sides. Okay? Okay, so, um, right, now th this can get more complicated, I mean this can get, um, in, in, in computing V, you know, uh, once you know that it exists to actually compute V can be quite um, involved and, you know, in, even in two dimensions it might require line integrals, um, so, um, hopefully we're going to get a chance to, to look at some of those examples. But another example is, is uh, that we kept showing it. It's uh, if I have a force, central force, then it's going to be, um, so if you have some object in the plane at the origin, then another object attracted by a force uh, of magnitude inverse proportional to the square of the distance, then this is going to be something like this, minus x over x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves, and minus y over x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves. Then you can write this as a gradient system for v, and that's kind of interesting, it's just 1 over x squared plus y squared to the one half. So this is just one over the distance from the origin, from the, the fixed point. Okay. Um, and actually, I take it back. Uh, this would not really correspond to that motion. Uh, you'd have to have second derivative in x and second derivative in y. So, anyway, the right hand side does does uh, match the gradient of this function. Okay. All right. So, let me talk a little bit also about Hamiltonian systems and then we're going to uh, wrap it up. So, Hamiltonian system is a, is a different class of, um, of, of nonlinear systems, of dynamical systems. They have a slightly different form and um, it can be actually, you can define that in, in any dimension, but just for simplicity, let's talk about R2. So, um, how does such a system look like? Well, it does look like a um, um, system of two equations with two unknowns, x, x prime and y prime. And x prime is defined as partial derivative of a function h with respect to y. And y prime is minus partial derivative of x, h with respect to x. 
where h is a function defined on say r2 is a, a nice function so twice differentiable called the Hamiltonian function okay so it's called the Hamiltonian function so if there is such a function and you can write your system in this form then uh, you have a Hamiltonian system at hand okay so um, what is an example well a quick example if I have x prime equals y and y prime equals minus x cubed plus x then um, of course the question is do you have a Hamiltonian system or not or maybe it's a gradient system how do we recognize it well um, it's the same kind of procedure is you have to make sure that the mixed partial uh, second partial derivatives of h if such an h were to exist that the mixed partial derivatives um, are uh, the same so let's see if we take this if I call this to be f and this g this time we have what's the test well f should be partial of h with respect to y and g is a minus partial of h with respect to x so you need you really need to have partial of f with respect to x equals second partial of h with respect to x and y equals second partial of h with respect to y and x so it has to be minus partial of g with respect to y so the test really is whether partial of f with respect to x equals minus partial of g with respect to y okay so in, in this case you, can, you clearly can see f is independent of x so there's going to be zero derivative of f with respect to x and g is independent of y so the two are uh, equal both are equal to zero so that this relation is, is holds true and in fact you can convince yourself that um, that you can write this as the following way so it's h to the fourth um, divided by four actually divided by two is okay minus x squared plus y squared is a Hamiltonian I'm sorry okay actually it's divided by 4 we we want to differentiate divided by 4 minus x squared over 2 um, plus y squared over 2 is the is a Hamiltonian okay simply take the derivatives with respect to x and y and see that you match those right hand sides okay okay so uh, so this is a Hamiltonian system with that Hamiltonian so what are the properties so the most important property of a Hamiltonian system of a Hamiltonian system is the following thing is that if I have x prime equals my, uh, partial of h with respect to y and y prime is minus partial of h with respect to x then h is constant along solutions so in a way it's also a Lyapunov function but it's not by any means strict Lyapunov function so this the this function does not decrease along solution it does not increase either and it's, what it is what it does is stays constant okay and that's very simple proof if I take the derivative of h along a the solution then again by the um, chain rule it ends up being oops, uh, partial of h with respect to x times x prime plus partial of h with respect to y times y prime but 
h x prime as partial of h with respect to y, partial of h with respect to y times, and y prime is minus partial of h with respect to x. So this is zero because these two terms cancel each other. Okay? So this means h of x and t and y of t is constant. Okay? Along solutions, right? So you can you can say you can say this way that that h is preserved. So the value of h is preserved. The value you started with h, the value you started for h, stays the same as you evaluate h along the solution. Or another way of saying. This is that um, solutions or trajectories, solution curves x of t um, coincide with level curves. Actually, let me be. With the level curves of the Hamiltonian H, okay. So, just a very simple example. Let's imagine I have x squared plus y squared, and I have one half. So, the Hamiltonian system is going to be what? Partial of h with respect to y, so that's y, and y prime is minus partial of h with respect to x, so this is minus x, right? So we know what this system looks like. Well, this system looks like I think it's going in this direction. Okay, but that's exactly coincides with the with the level curves of that function. Okay. Uh, even I mean a more more uh, I guess interesting example is to um, have the one minus cosine x plus y squared over two which is the Hamiltonian of the pendulum, so the, the uh, system describing the motion of the pendulum, not the linearized pendulum, right? So it's sine of x, so this is a nonlinear system. Okay, so that's, um, the picture here is a little bit skewed, it says, you know, there is some uh, equilibrium farther from from zero is uh, I think it's pi and negative pi, and in between there is some sort of a the level curves are and the, they are closed curves but they are not round. Okay, so you can see this in the in the actual um, in the plot of the pendulum with. No, no, uh, with no um, damping. Okay, so it's yeah. So you can see the solutions, and actually, this solutions, uh, this trajectories also stay. You know, if you start on a level curve, you stay on the level curve. Of the Hamilton, okay, and you can see how it kind of changes. Um, of course, there, there there are two equilibria here, so one is here, the other one is here, okay, and of course there is this one. So, can can you tell uh, the nature of this equilibria for a Hamiltonian system? This equilibrium. Which is would be a minimum, you know. Let's say it's a minimum for the um, Hamiltonian function. It's not asymptotically stable, but it is stable, right? So it is stable. Okay. So if I have, if I have a minimum, then it's a Lyapunov function, so I have stability, right? I don't have asymptotic stability. Of course, if it's not a minimum, and I think this, this other equilibrium are not 
there are critical points, but they're not minimum for the uh, Hamiltonian function, then, then they're not going to be stable, right? In fact, there are several points, as you can uh, as you can see, okay? All right, so um, last thing to, to say is that um, what happens if we linearize around an equilibrium for a for Hamiltonian system? So linearizing around an equilibrium uh, for a Hamiltonian system is basically gives you a, a linearization, a, li a linear system, right? Uh, in the gradient, in the gradient case, you had uh, symmetric metrics here, so the eigenvalues are all real. But in this case, the eigenvalues of A are not necessarily only real, but what they are is they always come uh, like this. They're either, if they're real, then they're symmetric, or if they're complex, then they're pure complex, and they are on this uh, imaginary axis, of course, complex conjugate. Okay, So I'll... Um, Let's let's just see a proof of this really quick. Um, I know this is actually what I assigned as a homework, so hopefully you get to watch this um, end of the uh, end of the lecture. So um, let's let's see. So if I have x prime equals minus h with respect to, uh, excuse me h partial of h with respect to y, right? Uh, and this is f and y prime is minus partial of h with respect to x, and this is g. Then what's a? It's partial of f with respect to x, partial of f with respect to y, partial of g with respect to x, partial of g with respect to y. So what is this? All right, so this is mixed partial of h with respect to x, y, uh, partial of f with respect to y, second partial of h with respect to y, right? Partial of g with respect to x is minus partial of second partial of h with respect to x squared and finally it's minus <coughs> partial, second partial of h with respect to x, y okay. so let's look at this maybe slightly different it's a matrix for which I have some a some b, some c, and then here it's minus a. Okay. So these two, these two mixed partial derivatives are, are are the same, right? So let's see how can an eigenvalue. How how do the eigenvalues for this matrix look like? Well, it's a minus lambda, b, c, minus a minus lambda. So this is. Let's see, a minus, so it's lambda minus a, lambda plus a, so it's lambda square minus i square minus bc, right? So you can see this. When is this guy zero? When lambda square is a square plus bc. So if a square plus bc is positive, then lambda square, uh, then lambda is plus or minus square root of a squared plus bc, right? But if a squared plus bc is less than zero, then lambda is plus or minus i square root of b minus that. So it's a squared plus bc, okay? So in both cases, you have this pure, either pure real, plus or minus something, or if it's uh, strictly less than zero, then it's other thing, right? 
Um, and I guess the case when this is greater than or equal than zero, if, uh, the case when this is equal to zero, it's also included in there, although this might correspond to something degenerate. So this will be a degenerate case. Okay, so that's um, probably a nice place to stop, and we'll continue next time. Thank you.